Our little podcast radio show discusses everything to do with working with the natural cycles of the universe, how we can have a more organic, more connected, peaceful and healthy life. From relationships, addiction and stress through natural healing, astrology, energy and spirituality and all points in between. My name is Steve Gunn. Welcome to The Flow. This week our subject is astrology, what it is, how it can help us understand who we are and how we can learn to surf the waves of the universal forces at work in our lives, as opposed to being swept away by them. As well as our regular posse here to help us learn about that is author and astrologer Priya Kale. But before we meet Priya, let's meet the posse. Hi, Janine in California. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Janine is a long-time researcher into all things metaphysical and paranormal. And now we go over to Sacramento. Uh, a gentleman I call a Renaissance man, an artisan and mystic. Mike, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. And over to the UK now, Sarah, a powerful and committed energy worker. And some of you helped co-produce this show. How are you, Sarah? I'm very well, thank you. Excited to be here. Welcome. Last but by no means least, Priya Kale, author and astrologer. Hi, Priya. How are you? Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. I'm well. Welcome Happy to the to show. Be here. Oh, glad. Glad you're here. Glad you can join us. Is there anything special yes. about today, astrologically, before we start? Well, yes. Actually, we're, we are heading into the full moon in Taurus, which is on the 26th. That is Tuesday in the morning for most parts of the world. Uh, but today we have a very special conjunction between Venus and Jupiter in the sky. And that's actually exact in just about maybe an hour. So as we're recording this. So, and Venus and Jupiter are the two benefics in astrology or what are known as the benefics. So they're the two planets that have the most benevolent influence. So that's very so when, auspicious for our recording then, is it? Yes, it is. Excellent. And it's in Virgo, so maybe we'll have no technical difficulties. Well, fingers crossed on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Priya, yes. in order to start the show, astrology has been important to every society, every civilization. What is astrology and why has it been so important? Well, I mean, this is, of course, uh, if you think about it, way back when, when think about early man who had nothing, had no light, had maybe fire, but before they even had fire, what the only thing they had to go at to look at at night were the stars and the planets and the movements of the planets. And then, so I can only imagine it must have been, they started to see the correlations between the movements of these planets and the cycles and the planets rising at a certain part of the sky and captured their imagination, but not just that. Then they started, I'm sure, started to see the correlations between life on Earth and what was being reflected in the sky. And so astrology has been a part of many civilizations. You would say the Greeks, the Babylonians, medieval times, of course, India and Vedic astrology, or well, we say Vedic astrology, but it's really called Jyotish. It's part of the Vedas, which are the ancient Hindu texts. And it's a complete system. It's a holistic system. So even um, Ayurveda, if you're an Ayurvedic doctor, you have to have a basic knowledge of astrology because they're looking at, you're looking at someone's elemental energetic map when you're looking at someone's astrology chart. So astrology has been a part of human life forever, if you ask me. And it links to other systems, doesn't it? It's heritage linked through tarot and other systems. Mike, you know about that, don't you? Yeah, um, the, the correspondences between tarot and astrology actually date back hundreds of years. Um, on the Western side, and in particular the way Hellenistic astrology is incorporated, usually comes through the Kabbalah, which was um, esoteric Judaism. And so there was this book um, called the Book of Formations, and uh, it talks about how um, the Hebrew language was the language of God and how God created the universe through, the, through these letters. And so they took the letters, which are 22 Hebrew letters, and they broke them down into uh, uh, three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 simple letters. And in this book, this is one of the first times that they correspond with um, the planets and the astrological signs. So the first three mother letters would be 
um, the active elements of water, air, and fire. And um, the seven double letters would be what we understand as the planets. Now, in this case, it's not just the planets as we see them astronomically, but it's the five closest planets and the sun and the moon. And then the remaining 12 elemental letters were um, corresponded with the zodiac signs. And so th this correspondence has, has um, more or less been inherited. And, you know, there are little changes here and there, but uh, all the way up to um, modern time, we start to see um, these type of correspondences on tarot cards. And, um, and, and, the, and, the, and the tarot cards, um, astrology and Kabbalah are all sort of different ways of looking at the same cycles. Absolutely. And, and, it's, and, it's in, and these cycles are connected directly through, through synchronicity rather than a cause and effect type of um, relationship. I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, that's, I think, one of the key things that people need to understand. It's not that the planets are doing anything to us, and it's very easy to blame Mercury when Mercury is retrograde. But really, it's, it's understanding that we're part of these greater, larger cycles and this one huge, amazing, mysterious universe that we live in. And the planets... I mean, when we meditate, we go inward to find that silence. When we're watching the planets, we're just looking at an external point of reference, but they're like a mirror, really, and they're reflecting the processes that are taking place within you. So, for example, Mercury represents the mind, and when Mercury is retrograde, it's really a time when we're seeing the apparent motion of Mercury reversing in the sky. It's not really going backwards. It's going backwards it's, with respect to the orbit of the Earth, isn't it? Exactly. From our viewpoint, yeah. From our viewpoint. And what that's really saying is the mind is always moving. We're always mo living in the past or the, or the future. And a Mercury retrograde is really a time to slow down and pay attention to the present. And it, it forces us to do that. It's an excellent point. The, the thing that I'm very interested in here is something that Mike, Mike picked up on and you've uh, commented on, and that, that is the universe is not a cause and effect model. It does not have this cause and effect situation going on. It's synchronistic. Everything is, is working in synchronicity. The thing about how we tend to understand things is cause and effect. And so people say, how can the planets affect us when they're so far away? And I explain to people, they don't. They are affected by the same forces that affect us. And the yeah. analogy I use is that if you get hungry at one o'clock and you look at your watch and it says one o'clock, the hunger is not causing the watch to say one o'clock. And the right. watch saying one o'clock is not causing the hunger. They are synchronistic with the universe, universal cycles. And at the same time, the sun will be almost overhead. None are causing each other. They're all affected by the same cycles. That, Yes, I, I mean, but these are sceptical questions, you know, and, and they're valid. What drew you to astrology, Priya? You could have got into all sorts of things because I know you're, you're very well read and you're very well travelled and very experienced. What is it about astrology for you? Well, to be honest, I can't remember a time when I didn't love astrology. Uh, there's a story my aunt, my parents tell me. Apparently, when I was about two years old, uh, my dad, there was an eclipse in the sky and my father explained to me what an eclipse was and I was so fascinated that I spent the next six months t telling anyone who walked in the door what an eclipse was and you know so many years later I'm still doing that I suppose. It fascinated me and I've always been drawn to everything to do with the occult and metaphysical world and my parents would take us, my parents are both Sagittarian and so until we were 15 years old, at least, we only got books as birthday gifts, which was great. But every time we went to the bookstore, I'd be lost in the astrology section. <laughs> so I think I've always been drawn to it. So it's in, the, it's in the blood. It's in your chart, we could say then, yeah? It is. Uh, my grandfather was an astrologer as well. I never met him, but I guess it's in the blood. Priya, when did you start your formal study of astrology? Um, once again, I mean, obviously when I was little, I mm -hmm. read things that I could understand, which was very basic stuff. And then as I, when I was about 15, I remember I started reading tarot cards as well. 
did so you was, did you sit down and use your own chart as an example and just try to try to learn from it at that time i did not when i was about 15 i didn't it was when i got into my 20s that i started to you know look at my own chart and see what it meant and it's still you know life was happening so astrology wasn't my focus in my early 20s it was always there but i never thought it would be a profession right mm -hmm. it was uh, after my divorce which was when i was about 25 26 i was married and after my divorce nothing made sense because i'm sure all of you here have been through your own periods of crisis and that was that phase of me wanting to know, you know, mm -hmm. needing to know, wanting to have answers. And I, astrology became the point of focus and I just poured into it. And the more I, but then the more I studied it, I realized, oh, it isn't what I think it is. You know, it just opened up a whole new gateway of understanding how the universe works. So it was interesting. And uh, maybe one more story that I'd like to tell is, since I grew up in India, um, I moved to New York when I was 22. But I obviously lived in India, grew up in India. And I've, in India, astrology is not such, it's a very common part of life. So everybody has their charts done. It's not unusual at all. And my mother would, you know, she, she loves listening to astrologers and stuff. So she'd always have astrologers come over and, you know, read our charts and but of course, they were reading in the Indian Vedic system. But still, they would make predictions. And I always wondered at that point, like I, I remember being really little, like not even five years old and listening to this person and just thinking, OK, wait, how do you know that? Because he, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. they would make very blanket statements like, oh, she'll be she's going to be a doctor, or an engineer, she'll be married at 30. I wondered, I wondered how they could make such definitive statements. I was like, okay, if he can find, if he can get no, then I can know. So I trust myself more than I trust him. And so I'm going to study it. And that kind of led, you know, into me studying astrology for myself. But yes, later, 20, after 26 is when my real study in astrology intensified. And I would study my chart. And, you know, I learned about astrology. I learned about myself. And I learned to accept myself, really. And then it was when I was 29 and at my Saturn return when I started doing astrology professionally. I'm interested that you say it helped you learn to accept yourself. Is that something that astrology does for other people as well? I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, I, I, at least when I'm with my clients and consultations, it's, that's what you're really working towards is self-acceptance. Let's ask our posse. Um, let's right? start with Sarah. Has it helped, um, Sarah? Has, it, has your knowledge of your own astrology helped you understand yourself? Um, a little bit, definitely. There's certain things I can read, and I think mm, that is a Piscean trait. But yeah, it interests me definitely. Janine, what what's your interest in astrology? What's your fascination? Where did it start? Um, with me, it started when I when I first heard about it. I was around nine years old and went to the library and it, there was one book on astrology and because I was nine it got into a lot of mathematical issues that I just couldn't deal with so I backed away but I've just <laughs> always been interested. <laughs> and do, is it something you follow closely? Um, it, it, I did at different times in my life because it has been so predictive. I don't know a lot about it. I would, would be reading a book and have my chart and look at something and think, ew, that's not good. And then I go to go to the next thing. It's almost like uh, what I hear with, when medical students start studying about diseases. Everything they read about, they think they have. <laughs> Absolutely. I once worked. On, I used to work in television. I once worked on a, on, a, on a late night show where they were talking to um, psychiatrists and therapists, and the production team at the end of it would all look so miserable because they all identified with all of these dreadful situations, <laughs> and nobody wanted to work on the show. And in fact, the joke was, "Who do I sleep with to get off this show?" You know. So. <laughs> Janina, has it has it helped you understand yourself more? Priya said that it's something that helps you understand yourself. Has it done that? Uh, with me, definitely. Mike, what about you? What what was your original interest, and and what has it done for you? 
Well, I, I actually had my birth chart done probably in the 90s. And this is interesting because at the, at the time I was really excited by astrology. And so the first thing I did was I was also playing music at the same time. And I thought, you know what, it'd be a good idea. I'm going to do birth charts on everybody else in the band. And so um, the, 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 the funny part of it is um, this was back before you could go on the Internet and just plug in your, your birth information and get a nice chart. So I did it by hand. and I did it by math and wow. got a couple of them wrong. So, so that, that was one re- really good way of uh, kind of t- kind of trying to take an objective approach to this new thing that I had discovered. And so for me, I, I felt m- moving forward from that, that the most Im- important thing to do was to sort of look at astrology over the, the, lo- the long term period, because, you know, you as a person, you mature. And so does your, yes. your understanding of astrology as you go forward. And I think a lot of the profound um, findings from this usually t- tend to come after you've been working with it a while. Yes. You know, if you if you n- notice multiple people that you know that have very similar signs, because I, I think that, you know we always look at astrological signs like to simplify things and break them down. But I think a lot of times astrology also teaches us that people are more complex, and it's more yes. than just your sun sign. That's an interesting oh, point, Priya. I mean, people talk about the natal chart as if it's a prison sentence. It's how you are forever. Is that true yes. or is it where you start from? No, it's, uh, that's not true. Yes, it's where you start from. Uh, and it, that's a very important point of understanding, even what Mike said. It's, so when, what is a natal chart? A natal chart is a picture of the sky at the moment of your birth. Like, let's say we took a camera you know, above where your mother was giving birth and we took a picture of the sky, that's what we would see. Now, all that means is you were, you were born in this moment in time, eternity, when these planets were configured in a certain way. And depending on how they're configured, that's how you experience life and how you express life. Or let me, let me put it this way. There's infinite manifestations for any planet, any sign, any energy, and that's because the universe is infinite. So especially when I'm doing readings or, you know, I won't, sure, I'm looking at a chart and I see, okay, you've got your sun in Taurus, or for example, me. In my case, I've got my sun in Taurus, I've got Scorpio rising, I've got my moon in Taurus. Sure, but where, like what Mike said, where am I? where am I in my life right now? So I'll start with asking the client their experience because they're going to tell me more about those planets rather than if I look at the planets and I start to tell them what they're like, then I'm limiting them and their potential to my knowledge of astrology. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Infinite possibilities, Mm -hmm. absolutely. So if someone has, for example, if someone has Mars in their seventh house, now, this is the seventh house relates with relationships, and Mars is a hot, fiery planet. So this is someone who needs very passionate relationships. And if they don't get that passion, then they're going to, then that Mars can act out in anger or resentment or just causing pain or, you know, clashes, friction. So... It's giving that Mars another way to channel itself. Like this is someone who needs, who could perhaps for, I mean, random example I'm throwing out is they could perhaps practice martial arts. So they're, they're, they're engaging that Mars energy in a controlled way. And then it releases that energy in a constructive way. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's, it's just looking at what is and then seeing if the energy is feeling pressured or or stressed, how else can you release that energy in your life rather than in the way that it is releasing right now unconsciously? So basically by explaining where the planets are positioned in their chart, you offer them help understanding the effects of that and how they can channel that in a balanced way. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, If I could give you another example... uh, I mean, it's understanding your energy. This is the other thing. Okay, here. I think this is a perfect example, but I just need to articulate myself well. It's that part about living in one reality, right? We all live in this one objective reality. But people will sometimes, due to perceptions, perceive things in a certain way. 
and what they're really doing is they're playing out their own energetic patterns that are in their chart or that's their mm-hmm. energy and they're projecting it out on the world and then getting offended by someone because someone said something and they just read it because it triggered something within them. So it's a very helpful way is, you know, especially when you have trigger points, you can see where that trigger is coming from. That trigger, then you can trace back to their childhood or that's one way to do it. When then you get them to tap into that emotion and release that emotion from the root, from the source as opposed to reacting to, you know, present situations and circumstances, which have nothing to do with the original wound. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. Priya, besides how astrology influences us in the area of the birth chart, how can it help us in looking at how the planets move through different areas of our lives? Okay, so the, one of the simplest ways to do this would be, uh, I mean, if you have your natal chart, that's great. If not, just key it in on astro.com. It's free and you'll have it. But the simplest way would be to observe the sun. So the sun moves through 12 signs, 12 zodiac signs a year as we go through the year. And look at where the sun is passing through in your astrology chart, you have 12 houses, each representing one area of your life. So when the sun is passing through a certain house, you're going to see those themes being highlighted in your life. So for example, the sun is now in Scorpio. So for anyone with Scorpio or Scorpio rising, the sun has just entered your first house. And for the past, when the sun was in Libra, the sun was in your 12th house. So for Scorpio and Scorpio rising, the past four weeks have been a very introspective period. They've been a period of maybe hibernation or going inward. Now the sun's back in their sign. So it's a coming out. It's Scorpio season. Well, that that makes sense. Um, And say um, Scorpio is my seventh house, which is what? Um, so that would be your relationships. And so that means that every year at this time of the year, when the sun enters Scorpio, for those 30 days, your relationships are highlighted. And you're going to see activity and more exchanges taking place in the area of your relationships. Ah. And is this true for all the other planets as well? As they rotate, oh, there's this complex web of interactions as they as they go through and hit these points in our natal chart, yeah? Absolutely. And that's why you can't just look at any one point, but this is just to give you an example. That's a simple way to get into it. But then you start layering the planets and you start seeing it's so complex. So it's a very complex matrix of interactions then, yeah? Yes. And is is this very much also an art to this as opposed to just the mechanics of it? Because often we'll see an aspect that one astrologer will say, gives a very yeah. healthy outlook for this uh, particular right. conjunction. Another astrologer will say it as a very detrimental. Yes. It, is that the art of interpretation? Does it become an art then as opposed to just the, just the science of it? I would agree. I would agree with that, which is it, it's, it's more than just a science. It's definitely an art. And exactly, all every astrologer is looking at the same data. It's how they interpret that data that matters. So, yes, there is an art to it. And I, I mean, again, astrology is a tool. So you could be using it in many different ways and we could use it for predictive. It's an excellent predictive tool as well. But really, what do we know for certain in this universe? What's a, There's nothing that's known for certain other than, at least that I can think of, other than the orbits of the planets. So are you saying, are you saying, which I think is what you're saying, is that we can predict cycles of energy. But, yes. But the, the cycles of energy themselves don't create events. It's no. living things relating and reacting to those cycles of energy. Exactly. And we which have, then create the events. Yeah. Absolutely. And the more balanced and the more consciously we're working with the energy and working with the universal flow, we can shape our reality. And it is possible to do that. 
so forewarned is forearmed. If we, we know that we're about to, that we're being influenced by a universal cycle, we can choose how we move forward knowing that, that what the influences are? Yes. I mean, for example, and I, I always say, you know, just because I'm an astrologer doesn't mean I don't have to live it. So uh, maybe we're going to talk about this later, but we'll talk about it now. For the past three years, since 2012, there was uh, a Uranus-Pluto square taking place in the sky. And we just finished, uh, the planets made a square aspect, which is a 90 degree angle to each other, seven times over a period of three years, between 2012 and 2015. So we had the last aspect in about March or April this year. And now we are past it. But since 2012 to 2015, you can look around your life, the world, people you know, everybody. It's been an incredible time of transformation and transition. And there's been a lot of friction because square aspects, they'll, it's a 90 degree angle, so they'll, they'll produce that friction. But it's like turning a corner. So the past three years have been very tumultuous. And I, okay, coming back to your question, as an astrologer and all astrologers, we all saw this coming. So we knew that, okay, these three years are going to be very strenuous and challenging, but they will shift a lot of energy. But still, when you get into it, like I can tell you, my life blew up in 2012 in ways that I did not expect. And in fact, I even joked about it. I said, you know, I'm an astrologer, but I didn't see this coming. And the whole aspect was, I mean, it was a Uranus aspect and Uranus is unpredictable. So, so you're, you're saying we can treat this as um, challenge or reward depending on how we react to it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it, you know something's coming. You can be prepared for it, but really how can you be prepared for it? Because you don't know what's coming. You just know that, okay, we're moving through an important, uh, say, energy vortex. So you know, keep your wits about you or stay centered is the best that you can do. But knowing that you're passing through it, it can help you to not just think you're going crazy. Well, I was thinking of astrology in terms of, um, you know, when you first start to learn it versus 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later. And I think a lot of that depends on kind of where we are and our relationship between our ego and soul. Because at first, when we take a look at those signs, we're kind of like, oh, what's the good sign? You know, or what's the bad sign? And, <laughs> and, and, and it's just like, we, we, we want to have like that one list of all that good stuff on the left and that right, right stuff. No, that's not me. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is how we approach astrology you know, initially, right. but uh, over time, I think the important thing, and this comes down to any of these tools, whether it's the Tarot or it's Kabbalah or anything else, we learn this stuff when we're kind of in our spiritual infancy, but it's really the payoff down the line when we start to get the ego out of the way and all the conceptual conceptualization out of the way Absolutely. that we actually start to come to a deeper learning with it. Because Absolutely. at first, you know, we want it to all be about us, but, re <laughs> but really it's not. And, and, it's and that's the maturity of moving forward is realizing, getting some objectivity, realizing that some of the challenges are also in your chart and then incorporating all of that into your life. Absolutely. And I, I will say like one of the best advices I got when I, in my earlier days of learning astrology was from one of my teachers who told me to throw out all my books. And it really was the best advice because then I, after having studied astrology for as long as I had, you just, yeah, I threw out all my books. I will, I didn't literally throw them out, but I started to focus on just my client work. And that just opened up a whole new world of understanding. Just like Mike said, you know, you, you go down this path and you realize the universe is much more mysterious and magical than you think. So there's, there's, a, there's a universal aspect to what's going on. For example, the, um, what did you say, the, the squares that we were, or the squares yes. that we yes. were just looking at, that will have effect on the United States, on the world, on everything. 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 In, in addition to what it does in our individual charts. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I would say that everyone... I mean, all of you, in some area of your life, you've had a major transition between 2012 and 2015. 
and we're all i would say even the world it's it's like aftershocks you know we've come out to the other side but now we're in this new it's almost like structures have been dismantled mm. and all structures have that have not been working have been dismantled i mean pluto's in capricorn so capricorn's a sign of government establishment it's a saturn rule sign and saturn has been in scorpio so it's we've seen the disintegration of you know structures and now we're in a place where okay we've moved past that but now there's a time to now is the time to start rebuilding this ties in when people predicting 2012 being the end of the world so rather than <clears throat> it being the end it was the end of a cycle yes i would say breaking so. down of the old ways making room then for the new ways to come through i would say so it certainly was i mean would you agree in your life i mean what was the past 3 years like for you yes definitely it's been a lot of change a lot of upheaval i guess change yeah i'd agree can um, i just say something about mike's point about um the astrology and the the ego stuff when we we want to we want to be this sign and we want to identify with all the good aspects and not the bad aspects when we're a bit younger and more naive um I was born right on the cusp, I mean literally within 15 minutes in time. So some astrologers said I was Sagittarius and some said I was a Scorpio. And then I would, so for half my life I thought I was a Sagittarius and people said, that's so typical of you being Sagittarius. And then when I found out I was a Scorpio, they'd say, that's so typical of you being a Scorpio. Right. And I really did, I've had this sort of duality <laughs> of people, people responding to me. So maybe um, you're just a Gemini. <laughs> probably I am. Probably I am. <laughs> so I wondered. I wondered if you should do an experiment and t tell our friends with different signs and see if they respond as if, oh, that's typical of you. I knew you were one of those because <laughs> there's this sort of expectation that goes with it. Yeah. That yeah. we can always find something to fit. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because people really did say to me, oh, that's typical of you. Other people said to me, no, 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 you're not a Sagittarius. You're the most Scorpio person I know. And they <laughs> just seemed to adapt depending on what I told them. Right. Now, coming on to that, can we, can we have a bit of fun with it? Because we've talked about the serious stuff of astrology. There are a lot of cliches about certain signs. I was, for instance, joke with Janine about being a Capricorn, about having the most organized shoe closet in the world. And indeed she does. So <laughs> can we give you, uh, can we talk about our signs and the, and the, the yeah. dreadful cliches that go with them and, and whether there's anything that's actually, um, there's any, sure. any meaning or significance behind that, even though it's sort of joking. So uh, okay. let's start with you, Janine, you're Capricorn. Yes. Um, I am. I'm an accountant. Yeah. I, don't think it, I don't think it could get any more Capricorn than being an accountant. I like order. I don't like change. I love my house. Uh, if I were elected president and were going to be moving to the White House, I would be panicked. But see, so. Capricorns, I have to say, like, I, I love Capricorn women, first of all. Some of my best friends are Capricorn women. They, have, they work hard. They're hard workers and all of that. But they're, they carry this air of respect, but they're the craziest people I know. <laughs> Honestly, they're like. Did she funny, say that? I know. <laughs> really? Must, must that... be must be some other aspect in the chart because there is a part of me that loves sequins and beads, which is about <laughs> as uncapricorn as you could possibly get. You probably got like Pisces. You got a planet in your house somewhere. of showbiz or something, haven't you? <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> so that's the that's the Capricorn cliche. Sarah, what sign are you? I'm Pisces. And what, what are the Pisces uh, cliches? Um, very sensitive, um, very indecisive, a dreamer. Um, are you sure about that? Well, that's what they say. <laughs> Priya, Priya, what are the, Priya, what are the Pisces stereotypes? Well, this, uh, what she said, yes, those are stereotypes and they're very... They are very dreamy, but they're very musical and creative, and but they can also be known to escape. So this is a little more serious, maybe not so funny, but you'll have Pisceans who have addictions. It's fairly common, but then that comes back to them being so sensitive. So they're trying to numb out a lot of pain, and Pisceans 
of well all science but Pisces definitely learn need to learn to have some boundaries or have a mm. container so they can pour that energy forth you're very creative aren't you Sarah you like design clothes and that sort of thing yes I enjoy that yes and I also do live in my own little world I suppose which is very typically Piscean. I can live in la la land myself and b dance around listen to music Piscean dream of in clothes I think we'd all like our own little world like that. Where do you get one? <laughs> <laughs> they have a magic a wand, shock. Steve. It's a bit Pisces of a shock to me when I have to realise that actually, oh yes, that's just part of my dream reality, that it becomes so real. <laughs> How cool. Mike, what, what are you? What sign are you? I'm a Virgo, and usually the big mistake people make about Virgos is they're all virgins. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going it's there true. in this show. That's the After Dark show that this comes later. This is not later, always yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest misconception about Virgos. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to ask. Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> what else, is it, what else is it about Virgos? Especially Virgos right an earth now. sign, yeah? Uh, I, sorry, I missed what you said. Is Virgo an earth sign? Virgo is an earth sign, and it's a very analytical sign. It's an earth sign ruled by Mercury. So it can be a very analytical sign. It it puts things in order. It organizes it. But Virgo is also the sign opposite Pisces. So this is something that's interesting. You have Pisces at one end of an axis and Virgo at the other end of an axis. So they're two extremes of the same energy. And if Pisces is ethereal, dreamy, cosmic energy, Virgo wants to create that and bring it into physical form and that's why virgos will strive for perfection at times does that sound they, like you mike yeah and especially the the practical result i think virgos are definitely about cutting through the chase and, and trying to get something done virgos are feeling pretty sexy right now i would say though <laughs> you've got venus <laughs> sounds and like your love life love life time. potentials picking up mike doesn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> woohoo <laughs> yeah virgos <laughs> Venus, Mars, and Jupiter in their sign. Things are getting hot for Virgos. So, Virgo. Organized. Organized, organized. and very sexy right now, I'm told. Uh, so they Mike, have so. a very organized black book. Little date book. <laughs> Mike, there's yep, so totally much that yeah. you haven't told us. So you're obviously a very, <laughs> you know, keeping this in the closet, your, your sexy outlook on life. <laughs> we do. We all have little notebooks with lots of lists in them. <laughs> in fact, I remember having a, a supervisor, I don't know, three or four years ago who came in. I found out he was a Virgo, and I kind of looked over his shoulder, and he had the book, too. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all share it. <laughs> I like to joke that I have a Virgo deficiency because I don't have any planets in Virgo, and I think my family will attest to that. So let's talk about you now, <laughs> Priya, about thing. your sign. Well, I'm a Taurus. I'm a Taurus, tor double Taurus, actually, sun, moon. And we like to take things slow. We're very patient. We're like bulls, you know. But bulls can also charge at things. Is, is, there, is that a, a, a stereotype of uh, the bull in the it china is, shop? and is I would a... say it's not very untrue. <laughs> 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 it just depends. See, the way I like to put it is like I can be like Ferdinand the bull, just laying in the grass, minding my own business. As long as you leave me alone, all is well. When you start poking and prodding, <laughs> that's when you don't want trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely not do that then. No, I'm fine. Tourists are very grounded. They are very grounded. They're very grounded and uh, they're very practical people, I would say. They're very practical. And Taurus does yep. rule money and material energy. But really, Taurus is about values. So it's going beyond the physical. It's why a rotten, dead, like an old teddy bear would mean something to you, but nothing to someone else. What about Scorpio? I'm a Scorpio. Well, be, be gentle, please. Well, you, you tell us. <laughs> you're, you're <the laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> you're the mystery man. <laughs> Are we mysterious? No. Are you? I don't think so. I'm, well, of course, my perspective Scorpio. is that I'm pretty transparent, but uh, that would be my perspective, wouldn't it? What was the stereotype of the Scorpio? 
well, uh, it can go both ways. They can be known to be very dark and vindictive and, you know, undercover. Is that the Pluto aspect of it? That's the, I would say that's the Pluto aspect of it. But you have to understand, Scorpio is also all about transformation and metamorphosis. So it, you're, you're, you're constantly in a state of transformation. And for uh, you to have gold, iron ore has to be, sorry, sorry, the ore has to be subjected to high temperatures before you can get something that's golden. So Scorpios are, you know, always purging the darkness in a sense. I can identify with that. It just depends on whether they do it consciously or unconsciously. And if they're doing it unconsciously, then they're making life for he hell for everyone. You know, it's like the scorpion. They'll kill you and they'll kill them. They'll die themselves. It sounds delightful. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so happy being me. One thing I can tell you is we, we, we give plenty of chances, but once the chances have gone, we just do not forgive. But three million years is, is not long enough. Once, once you've had your three chances, forget it, dude, because there's no going back. That's true. They can hold a grudge. Yeah. Scorpios can certainly hold a grudge. So we better not prod the ball and we better not piss off the scorpion. Is that right? Absolutely. And especially not when there's a Taurus full moon in the sky and the sun is in Scorpio. <laughs> hmm. Excellent. Also, well, Scorpios also, of course, the other part is their very reputation for being very sexy. No, and, not, and exactly. not true. Not true. No. Not true at all. Definitely not wrong person. Yeah. Um, Priya, um, what would you tell us what is unique about astrology? Well, it ties the heavens and the earth together. And we have a physical point of reference outside of ourselves. To, and then we see physical events play out in relation with the physical movements of the planets. So you can so, see astrology at work, basically. Yeah. You can, exactly. And the more you watch the cycles of the planets the more you can tune into those cycles. And a very simple way to do it is to watch your life over the full moon and the new moon. And what do we full, expect from a full moon and new moon? How do they affect us? So a full moon will always bring completion, closure, revelation. The moon is full in the sky, so it's reflecting the light of the sun back to the earth, and we have full revelation. It will also bring endings. And then that leads into the, a two-week period when the moon starts to vein in the sky. And then we come to the new moon. And the new moon is the time when we see no moon in the sky because the sun and moon are aligned. And this is a time, metaphorically speaking as well, the sky is dark. There's no light in the sky at night. And so we have to go inward to find insight. Whereas, and then... A new moon is also a time for new beginnings. So if you want to start something new, a new moon is a great time to do it because then as the moon grows, you're going to see whatever the seeds you're planting grow to fruition and completion, and then you have another full moon two weeks from then. And then everything is revealed. And then you move back into the new moon cycle. So that's actually a very helpful and practical and very simple way for, even if you don't want to be an astrologer, to just start to watch the cycles in your own life. And then, of course, if you take a look at your natal chart and start to see where that new moon is happening, you'll see where those new beginnings are happening. So, so you can work with, the, work with the energy rather than going against it. Exactly. It's, it's learning to work with the energy. It's, it's like when you want to put, put a boat out, it would help if the, you had high tide. You can still do it with, when the tide is low, but it's just going to take you longer. It's not that you can't do things when, oh, Mercury is retrograde. It's just understanding that, okay, these are the conditions. It makes it more difficult. Right. You're, you're just factoring it in. And let's face it, life happens. You can't always wait for the planets to be in a perfect position. And yeah. they're never always in a perfect position. So, you know, it's learning to navigate it and looking at the currents. Like, for example, if you're having a Saturn transit, a very strong Saturn transit, Saturn can bring that sense of, obstacles or restriction but it's learning to respect that and then you can move forward with it it's just learning to work with the energy what's complementary with to astrology prayer well 
Mike will definitely talk about this, but the tarot definitely works really well with astrology. Um, yeah, you can actually put all kinds of different disciplines on a chart and compare them. Um, I brought up the Kabbalah earlier because that's what I was trained in. And so a lot of times, um, you know, you're enlightened by the, the other disciplines that you use. And so if I was looking at Gemini in astrology and I was trying to get a deeper understanding of 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 uh, how a Gem Gemini interacts with people, then I'd also look at the lover's t tarot card. And I'd also look right. at the he Hebrew letter Zayin. And they're all different things, but they have this same synchronous relationship between them. And, and the point of this, uh, the underlying factor of this is the soul connects through all things. So that would be the lovers in tarot symbolizes the duality of the, Ge the Gemini, yeah? Yeah, and, and in particular, the relationship hu hu human beings have with their physical side and their soul side, because I don't, I don't remember specifically the myth behind Gemini, but it was about two twins, and, and one of the twins ended up being immortal, and the other twin was mortal. And so it's that relationship as well. It's not just about lovers or romantic lovers, because if it was, it would be not ruling the third, it, it would be ruling the seventh house and not the third house that it does. Well, it, it also represents choices, and that's the third house, right? That's the duality of the mind. So you'll often, with the lover's card, you'll have a choice. Mike, are there any other obvious sort of correlations with tarot cards and signs that we can just have a couple more examples? Um, well, there's um, Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that corresponds to the fool, um, and also uh, the element of error. And so this is, you know, in, in the, the usual tarot signs, we have sort of this uh, figure about to sort of walk off of a cliff. And that's sort of the, the, an idea of, the, of a beginning, of like a birth, of, of, of being so clear that you can take any step in any direction that you want. So the full symbolizing not stupidity, but naivety. <laughs> and yeah, na naivety in, in, a, in a positive way, in, in a, not having expectations. I would say that corresponds with Aries. That's the beginning of the zodiac. So it's the child. It's the innocence of anything is possible. Like Aries do not know the meaning of no. Find an Aries. They don't understand the meaning. Nothing's impossible for an Aries. So that's that fool. Like everything's possible. It's a it's a new world. They look at the world. The fool will look at the world with wonder. Like a child looks at the world with wonder. Right. In, in the case I meant, I actually chose um, a tarot card that was, was, was more of an elemental sort of level. Oh. Because it's like, okay, if you take the 22 ma major um, arcana cards, 12 of them are related to astrology, 7 the planets, and then 3 um, mother letters, which, which are water, fire, and air. And so oh. Aleph is air. So it, it, it's sort of a, maybe a greater potential in the same way because from those three letters come the seven and from those seven come the 12. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. I and, did and, not know and, that. Right. And, and, and another thing that, that's really interesting because, the, the, you know, if you think of a cube, which is a three-dimensional, um, you know, representation, so it's similar to our lives, these, all, the, these different um, astrology signs and tarot also match up to sides of the cube. So with the three um, other letters, you have the directions, you have the height and the width and the length. And then with the uh, seven letters, you, you have the faces of a cube, in, in, including the inside. So there's seven, you know, six sides of a cube and then the middle. And then 12 are the edges. Wow. And so in a way, what it's, try, what, what it's trying to say is that this is directly related to our physical universe. And that's why Earth isn't considered an element when it comes down to these type of readings right. because you're, you're making those operations on Earth. I, I think a lot of the idea of making all these correspondences, and I, I'm not so sure how effective this has been on my end, but the idea was sort of to, to sort of give you a, give a shock to the way you're thinking, to, to overload your brain so much that, um, that, that you, you start to become more prescient that there's a soul behind everything. And it didn't really work for me, but that's sort of a theory kind of behind making all these correspondences because as you can tell it's all um it's math and, it, and it's stuff it and is. it's information and it's really rich and so that's part part of the maturity of learning astrology is is to to be able to use that information in terms of the soul's progress 
Absolutely. And uh, astrology is so much about math and physics as well. You know, it's it's angles that the planets are making and it's understanding how the energy is flowing. I often like to say the planets are like, to me, maybe it's because I studied art, but they're like, one way to describe it is, is like, they're like colors, you know, when two planets come together, you're making the, the energy fuses and there's a third color, but then there can be infinite shades of that color. So it's, it's, we're painting when we live life. Maybe that's I agree. A little creation. Creation. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, this is the related to the tree of life side of the Kabbalah, which is a little, little map. And, and so if you look at the, yeah. at the top of it, you're seeing no color at all because there's no color for, you know, co colors are basically something that happens on the, in the physical universe. And right. so you can see sort of in the middle of the glyph, there'll be red and blue and red and bl red, red, blue and, and yellow, which are actually the same Primary colors. We're talking about. Yeah. And then they mix. Thank you for that. Can we, We've gone from the sort of rather complex, which is fascinating. Can we go to the sort of oversimplistic end of astrology, people reading stuff in newspapers? How useful is that? Is it useful? Is it misleading? Well, okay. Your daily stars uh, in the newspaper uh, or on the website or whatever it is. I see, I know. Useful side for the most part. I know you find it useful, Mike. You say or not? No, no, actually the opposite. I, I, um, now, this this isn't to say that 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 this kind of thing can't be done by professionals, but in terms of just that sort of like general cafe astrology, you know, right. I don't think any of that's particularly useful. I mean, yeah. this is where what Steve was saying comes in, you know, it's an art, it's an art, like writing horoscopes is an art. And there's some horoscope writers who do it really well. And then some that, you know, you read in the papers and it's, it could be for anyone. So it, Again, it, like finding an astrologer that works for you is like finding a good doctor. But, but in terms of reading the daily stars online, which a lot of people would do, is it Mike saying it's actually detrimental? Would you say it's detrimental? Or is it something that gets people more interested in astrology and they can go deeper and maybe have a consultation with you or somebody else and, and, and go deeper into it? Is it, is it, is it a, a drug that takes us deeper into something that's more healthy or is it a drug that causes an addiction and, and sticks us where we are. I, I, I would say that, that what, what you see in the newspapers is very different from what you see from, from pro professional astrologers or those who have been involved in the occult. Um, and so I, I, would, I would think that, that it's mostly detrimental because the type of people that are looking at it usually aren't as involved and, and haven't gone in depth with it. And so they're more likely to look at a horoscope and say, oh yeah, how does that fit me? And a lot of times try to fit it to what they're doing. Yes. I would say both is true. A horoscope can never replace a reading with a professional astrologer that perhaps you've, you know, familiarized with their work and you've been reading their work for a while. But then at some point, I would say it's helpful to, you know, have that consultation if it, it intrigues you rather than get, get stay stuck and attached to needing to read that every day. There was a period in my life where I would read my horoscopes every day, but then you get into the flow and then one, the more you work with astrology, you don't need to read them every day. You're already in tune with it. So how would you say, people who do read them every day but want to go deeper, what would you suggest? I would suggest find an astrologer. Well, of course, I'm available for consultations, but find an astrologer that you really connect with and speaks to you. And that's a very personal thing. But also I would all recommend that... Find an astrologer who uh, is going to, and any professional astrologer would, but will tell you what you need to hear. Priya, I've heard that if you read the daily astrology columns online, that you should look at the, the one mm -hmm. that's written for, the, for whatever your rising sign happens to be, if you know it, as well as your sun sign. Can you tell us why? Yes, because uh, when we write sun sign horoscopes, what we're doing is we're kind of rotating the chart. So, for example, if you're a Capricorn with Taurus rising, then when I'm writing the horoscope for Taurus, for the sign of Taurus, I'm assuming Taurus to be the first house and then the planets. So, for in your case, you have Taurus rising. Taurus is your first house, which is why, although you're a Capricorn, even a Taurus horoscope would relate for you. 
Does that make sense? And astrology is holographic. So I would say if you're a Capricorn with Taurus rising, read both. See which one relates. You'll see an overlap. Okay, that makes sense. Um, there's sort of a little little story or, or legend that goes along with rising signs and sun signs. And that's the idea that when you're born, you're born facing your rising sign. And your challenge is to face your sun sign by the end of your life. Ooh. Hmm. That actually leads to a question that I have, actually, quite interestingly, Mike. Interesting. Okay. Uh, as in, what influences which sign we're born in on the soul journey? Well, uh, so this is, this is very interesting because, Mike, I hadn't heard that before. But uh, from what I've heard, the ascendant which or the rising sign uh, what is that it's basically the point that was on the eastern horizon when you were born so what they say and i've heard this from other astrologers and i've read it what they say is that what remains constant through your lifetimes is your ascendant so because the sky is always moving and you're going to be born you know you could have a different sun sign moon sign all of that will change but your ascendant apparently stays the same so that's kind of your soul's journey point. Interesting. I haven't heard that. That's what I've, I mean. That's what I've heard. So. Yeah. And I, I, that makes sense to me. Just watching astrology work, that would make sense to me because that's like, that's the path you're on. That's your ascendant. That's where you're headed. Let's let's go into what can you tell us? You you started to talk about the times we're in. You started to talk, you talked about a, a very interesting aspect from 2012 to 2015. What can you tell us about from here on in? What what are we to expect? Well, now we're past that square, so we are out on the other side. And as I mentioned before, we are in the spirit of rebuilding. Uh, Saturn is now in Sagittarius and will be in Sagittarius for the next, until 2017. So there's, Sagittarius is the sign of freedom and of new pathways and exploring new pathways. And Saturn can sometimes feel like a restriction, but there's going to be that sense where, you know, we are coming to a fork in the road and it's not enough to know the path, you have to walk it. So this is, because Sagittarius is also the sign of spirituality. And I think this relates with part of the pop spirituality that we're seeing around the world right now, where there's plenty of that. There's plenty of people just putting up memes, but is that really helping? What, what's, and, the, what's the message? What's the, the, what, do we, what do each of us need to learn? What do each of us need to transcend to this forthcoming period? The, do the spiritual work and spiritual work as in the energetic work. We're going to have to do it. There's no, no other escaping. way. escaping. There's no escaping it. This is a time of reckoning spiritually then. You can't fake it, yeah? You can't fake it. And it'll just get tougher until people actually face it and do it. Yes. You're just going to have to do it now because there's, or you're going to fall off the edge. At which point? <laughs> <laughs> we'll say thank you very much thank you to Priya thank you to Sarah thank, thank you. you to Janine thank you to Mike this has been our little show on astrology hope you want to join us again